Oh, and we are record. We are recording today. As I should mention we are uh, not only recording today, but um, we also these slides have a phenomenal set of speaker notes along with them. So you don't really need to worry about catching every detail uh, that is being shared. And we will uh, send you a note along with the recording, a link to the recording after the webinar, probably uh, within within a week. Okay, so with those housekeeping details attended to. I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. You, the attendees of this webinar, are from institutions that support the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. So I am really thrilled to welcome our presenters today. Um, but first, I'm going to turn things over to Chayla Weber, who will say a few words of introduction. So over to you, Chayla. Hi, uh, good morning and welcome everyone. Or good morning from the West Coast. Um, I'm Chayla Scott Weber, a senior, senior program officer uh, with the Research Library Partnerships Partnership, where I focus on work with archives, rare and distinctive collections. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm just going to give us a brief framing introduction this morning, and then I'll hand it over to our presenters. Um, OCLC has a long history of work in the area of archives, special and distinctive collections and research libraries. And we work in special collections because um, we recognize that they're an important site of knowledge creation that uh, is made possible by the library's commitment to the stewardship of their of their distinctive collections. And we want to support libraries in, in making best use of that investment. Um, within that timeline of work, we have helped to support the evolution of work with born digital collections from 2012 to 2017. We created a series of outputs intended to ease the transition to working with born digital and offer concrete practical advice uh, about how to get started through our demystifying born digital series. And then in 2017, our, our research and learning agenda for archive special and distinctive collections identified next steps for born digital as a key shared challenge that research libraries uh, were grappling with. Um, among the needs articulated there were building appraisal tools and frameworks, um, as well as developing models for distributed responsibility for born digital collections. Uh, in uh, last year, in 2020, um, we held a conversation with RLP partners about processing born digital collections further, and, and it further illuminated the sort of evolving need uh, around born digital. In that, um, in that conversation, uh, which is summarized in a blog post, uh, the screenshot of which you see here, um, accessioning was, was called out as a key practice for born digital collecting. At participants were spending significantly more time on accessioning than processing activities, and they talked about the, the way that born digital requires a sort of more expansive approach to accessioning. Uh, a major portion of time spent in accessioning uh, they identified was, a, was devoted to appraisal. And because born digital records can't be as easily examined in situ, um, a, often a lot more appraisal work was happening after a collection came in than before as it might in the paper context, which meant a heavier appraisal burden at the point of accessioning and shifting responsibility about who was doing uh, appraisal and when. And so all of this points to a need to rethink accessioning, appraisal, and responsibility models in a born digital paradigm, um, which is why I was so excited that our presenters were uh, agreed to uh, come today and share with us the ways that um, the UC libraries have been experiencing this and their recommendations for a more holistic model uh, for this work that addresses the needs of born digital, but really I think can also benefit all of our collections. Um, so uh, before I turn it over to them, I'll just encourage you to put questions into chat throughout and we'll be asking them at the end of the presentation. And also a reminder that we will be sending out the slides and speaker notes after the presentation. Um, so you don't have to like madly try to scribble down every word that <laughs> is happening here today. So with that, I will turn it over to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Shayla. Welcome everyone. We are so excited to be here with you to discuss a multi-year project to revise the UC guidelines for efficient archival processing. 
We will specifically spend some time today discussing new recommendations for holistic approaches to born digital appraisal and accessioning. And uh, thanks again to Shayla for that lovely introduction and to Mary Lee and Mercy and others at OCLC for their help setting up this webinar. So before we dive in, we'll introduce ourselves since you can't see us. Um, so I'll start us off. I am Alvia Arroyo Ramirez and I am the Assistant University Archivist at UC Irvine. I'm Kate Denton. I'm the Supervisory Archivist at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm Shara Peltzman, and I'm the Digital Archivist at UCLA Library. So for those who are unfamiliar, the three of us work in library special collections departments at different campuses in the University of California system, which consists of 10 campuses across the state of California in the United States. Because we're part of the same system, this provides us with opportunities to work together on intra-institutional collaborative projects, such as the one we will focus on today. So this is what we have outlined for today's discussion. First, we'll share a bit on the history of and impact of the UC guidelines for efficient archival processing. Then we will dive into the revision work and its process, specifically highlighting new recommendations for born digital care, as well as provide context for these recommendations. Then we'll share how the revision recommendations have influenced our workflows by sharing individual case studies at each of our campuses. As previously mentioned, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please write your questions um, on the chat or hold on to them until the end. And I should also mention that our presentation features selections of born digital content from each of our repositories. And we find that uh, discussions of archival practice, particularly as they relate to born digital practice, often feel disassociate from, disassociated from these very collections in our care. And we hope that featuring our collections today will surface a stronger connection between co collection content and archival labor. So the UC guidelines for efficient archival processing were originally published in 2012, and they were developed in response to a survey of UC library archival holdings that identified a 71,600 linear foot backlog and an estimated 5,800 collections with no public facing record across the different campuses. The guidelines were developed in response to the survey and at the height of Dennis Miser and Mark Green's MPLP or more product less process popularity, which advocated for efficient archival processing approaches like describing collections at the aggregate level. Since its publication, the guidelines have been broadly acknowledged as a cornerstone for implementing efficient processing techniques through its recommendation to expose all archival holdings, advising processors to conduct value score assessments, and process collections at the collection level, just to name a few of the recommendations um, outlined in the original guidelines. These recommendations at the time were bold, and they helped archivists at UC and across the profession advocate for implementing efficient archival approaches. And since the guidelines publication, efficient processing has now become standard practice for many archivists. However, language and linked references in the guidelines have since become outdated. Additionally, there's now a growing sense in the profession that efficient processing, while important to addressing processing needs of backlogs, cannot eliminate backlogs on its own. It became clear that uh, too many archivists at the UC system that systems with, um, or sorry, issues with collection management, appraisal, accessioning, and over collecting also needed to be implica implicated as major contributors to the growth of our physical and digital backlogs. And so the 2020 revisions to the guidelines speak to a more iterative and holistic collection management approach that takes um, into account these contributing factors. One of the more drastic changes in archival practice since 2012 has been the increase, increasing presence of born digital materials in archival holdings. At the time, the guidelines, um, at the time that the guidelines were published, recommendations for preserving and providing access to born digital materials were still very much in an infancy stage. And since 2012, there has been an increased amount of publications concerning 
emerging best practices for born digital description, access, and processing. And here are just a few publications that have helped shape best practices and standards for born digital care that have been published in recent years. In 2018, a group of UC archivists began to think about how the guidelines were currently being used and how they can be reframed from a defense of efficient processing and more towards a holistic set of extensible collection management practices. So there are 12 members of this revision team representing the majority of the libraries. Each member of the team is listed here on the slide, as well as our reviewers and other contributors. So special thanks to the folks listed on the bottom here. The revision work over a span of an entire year and divided up the work into smaller groups to focus on specific areas. Feedback that was supplied via another survey supported the addition of or the expansion of recommendations of specific areas in the guidelines, specifically accessioning, born digital, and appraisal. This feedback helped formulate a total of four subgroups or teams that worked on sections pertaining to appraisal and reappraisal, accessioning and deaccessioning, processing, and lastly, born digital. In addition to these area focused groups, there was an editorial team that focused on revising the introduction and reviewed the entire guidelines. Kate was part of this editorial team and also worked on the reappraisal and deaccessioning team, in addition to leading the charge of the entire group. So thanks to Kate for her leadership um, here. And the Born Digital team included Shira, myself, and Charlie McQuarrie, who is the digital archivist at UC San Francisco. So on the surface, the Born Digital team's task was simple. We were asked to review the section pertaining to Born Digital, determine what needed to be changed, and suggest revisions accordingly. This would have been fine, but the problem was that the Born Digital section of the original UC guidelines consisted of about a single paragraph's worth of advice, a sum total of about 293 words by our original count. We quickly understood that the lack of substantive guidance meant that we would essentially need to write this section from scratch. But after just a couple of brainstorming meetings, it became more clear to us that we really needed to rethink the entire plan. The list of things that we wanted to address was so expansive that creating the section, um, a separate section for Born Digital would be unworkable. In addition, we shared a, a deep belief that the guidelines should speak to the day-to-day -day experiences of archivists throughout the UC system. And we really felt that born digital processing is, of course, archival processing. And to cordon off born digital and treat it as distinct or boutique was, in our view, neither practical or realistic. So the three of us approached Kate to advocate for interweaving born digital strategies throughout the document so that born digital recommendations were fully incorporated into the fabric of the guidelines. Both Kate and the group at large were entirely supportive of this new proposal, but the expanded scope of the born digital team role meant that we would shoulder a larger commitment to this project than previously anticipated. It also meant that the entire team had to rethink the work plan and extend the target timeline to account for this additional work. What we decided to do is more collaboratively work with other subgroups on their sections. While this essentially meant that Charlie, Shira, and I had revision work practically every month, this proved to be a, an effective strategy because it meant that we had eyes on each section twice. Once when that section first presented their proposed edits, and again when the Born Digital team um, did a close read, which we argue made the guidelines stronger in the long run. So now I'll pass it on to Shira, who will talk about recommendations, the recommendations we, we introduced to Born Digital Care. Thanks, Alvia. I'll be spending some time going into detail um, about not only the changes that we introduced, but also our reasoning behind making the changes we made, since I think that this will provide some insight into how these guidelines differ from other appraisal, accessioning, and processing resources currently available. 
for me, one of the things that really sets the UC guidelines apart is the upfront and frankly somewhat blunt acknowledgement of the need for policies to support efficient and extensible collection management. I included the quote on the left hand side of the screen because I think that it does a great job of summing up our thinking on this issue, which is that policies should be written proactively and not reactively. We shared a strong belief that policies undergird responsible stewardship, and for that reason, we spent time up front discussing the importance of having policies in place to guide actions taken at each step in the arc of a life cycle. We provide a list of policies in the guidelines that represent a basic starting point, which is what you see on the right hand side of the screen. And I want to spend just a moment highlighting the final two, since they're the ones that, mo that relate most directly to born digital. The first of these is, the, is a digital preservation policy. We did this because we felt that a digital preservation policy is an important tool of accountability. As the guidelines state, if an institution endeavors to collect born digital material, they therefore have a responsibility to preserve it. We felt that having a digital preservation policy provides one way to meet this institutional commitment, and we wanted to make this connection explicit. The second policy that we mentioned is an accepted or recommended digital formats policy. Clearly understanding and articulating what formats you do and do not have the ability to support is vital for responsible stewardship. In addition to, be, in addition to being an ethically questionable practice, acquiring born digital material that cannot be adequately accessed or preserved is a tremendous waste of, res waste of resources and can ultimately present a challenge with respect to donor relations. With both of these policies, I think that stating the need for them up front in the introduction is to illustrate that holistic stewardship is necessarily a shared effort and one that has to be, that has to be intentional. It does not happen by accident and it cannot happen in an environment that does not support the collaboration, communication and transparency that policies like these require. In the area of appraisal, one key set of recommendations we made were for selectors of born digital materials. We made seven recommendations in total, but I'm only going to address a few of the most relevant. Choosing to create a section that focuses on selectors, even though they may not necessarily be the primary audience, I think really comes back to what Elvia was talking about a moment ago with respect to grounding the guidelines in a more holistic approach. We wanted to emphasize the interrelatedness of each stage of the arc of a life cycle, and particularly the impact that earlier actions have on downstream stages. First, we tried to really emphasize in as many places as we could the importance, the importance of, of appraising born digital material prior to acquiring and accessioning it, and noted the problems that can arise if appraisal is deferred. We also recommended that appraisal should involve all impacted stakeholders whenever possible, but especially so when it comes to born digital. Specifically, we went out of our way to highlight the importance of communication between selectors and the archivists responsible for digital collections during the pre-acquisition phase. All of the best practices and guidelines that I've encountered regarding acquiring born digital generally talk about the importance of communication between donors and the repository, but where I think the UC guidelines really make a contribution is laying out the various ways that curators can work with archivists to provide quicker, more resource efficient access to born digital materials. In relation to this point about communication, um, as a quick aside, I just want to note that one aspect of the guidelines that really stands out to me is how they go out of their way to push for more and better communication across the board by encouraging selectors and archivists alike to embed an awareness of the labor required for technical services to provide access to efficient, minimally, or even unprocessed collections. Directly connecting selectors and archivists upstream choices and documentation practices to the hurdles that technical services will eventually have to overcome as they try to provide seamless and frustration free access to a collection down the line is an approach that I think is both noteworthy and worth emphasizing. Another important recommendation we made was to be realistic about what pre custodial appraisal will actually entail specifically. We noted that a predominance of discrete removable legacy media like floppy disks and zip disks, for example, will make appraisal more difficult since these formats are time intensive to work with and donors may no longer have the equipment necessary to access and view materials stored on these media. 
This is not to say that we would never acquire something that's challenging to appraise, but rather that particularly given the upfront appraisal model that these guidelines champion, it's critical that selectors understand the labor involved and approach this task realistically. We also made the recommendation for efficiently appraising born digital material at a high level. Again, there are more recommendations uh, in the guidelines that I'll have time to mention today, but the two that I wanted to call out both emphasize strategies for doing this work efficiently and in the aggregate. So for instance, surveying carriers, disk images, and directories rather than individual files, and focusing decision-making primarily on identifying accepted formats rather than renaming or rearranging files. Hence the need for having the accepted or recommended formats policy that I mentioned earlier. Our goal with these recommendations was above all to make them pragmatic and practical for us. Uh, and pragmatic and practical. For us, a holistic approach to born digital really depends on being realistic about what this work will entail. And I think you can probably see that this is a recurring theme already uh, as well as throughout the guidelines. For example, when it comes to accessioning, uh, we wanted to address the reality that this means something very specific in the context of born digital and requires more in-depth work. In other words, you haven't truly accessioned the material until you've taken the files off the media on which it was received. I wanna emphasize this point because I think that there's conflicting schools of thought about what actually constitutes accessioning in the realm of born digital. Redefining the idea that accessioning for born digital must necessarily include file transfer is something that needs to happen profession wide. And we wanted to use the guidelines to draw a line in the sand on this point. We're aware, however, that this work is time consuming, and we really tried to highlight the exponential increase in processing time and cost that collecting digital media and especially legacy digital media will usually entail. To do this, we emphasize the need to determine upfront if the value of the collection warrants the enhanced interventions required to make it available. This idea of assigning each collection a specific value and then using this score to determine levels of processing effort is a hallmark of the original UC guidelines. So while it isn't exactly a new concept, I think that being this explicit about making that valuation when it comes to collecting digital materials is somewhat novel. Another area of focus for us was on providing baseline target steps for responsibly accessioning born digital material. Since we frame our discussion of accessioning in the UC guidelines as a one-shot opportunity that represents a unique window of time for the archivist to apply their judgment and expertise, we felt it was important to establish a set of minimum requirements for this step. This is an abbreviated version of what we came up with. Assign unique IDs, run a virus scan, or maybe don't if your workstation is networked and IT has sufficient pre-existing campus-wide security protections in place, transfer files off carriers, perform a cursory review of files for PII using either automated tools for text-heavy collections or a visual or aural spot check for AV contents, generate a file list instead of hash values, and finally, package content for storage and possible access. Here I say possible access because for accessions that do not present any PII or security issues, we consider these baseline accessioning steps to be sufficient and feel comfortable providing access at this stage. These steps are neither new nor controversial in and of themselves, but by outlining these accessioning requirements, we are asserting that this is what it takes to establish baseline physical, administrative, and intellectual control of a collection, and that these steps constitute the bare minimum of what needs to happen upfront in every single case. There are not many resources that define what it means to accession born digital material as clearly as I think the guidelines do. Um, and in that respect, I do think our work truly represents a unique contribution. When it comes to processing, we introduced a number of important recommendations that I consider to be, if not novel, then at least noteworthy. One of our major recommendations was to avoid disk imaging unless the added cost has been justified. This was for several reasons. First, Recent scholarship by Monique Lasser and Jess White has called into question the default practice of capturing and retaining disk images due to the ethical problems involved in capturing data, including deleted files, that donors may not have consented to make available. Another factor is the extra time and effort required to facilitate a disk imaging and processing workflow, which we felt was unjustifiable in most cases. And finally, 
We also took into consideration recent scholarship by Keith Pendergrass, Walker Sampson, Tessa Walsh, and Laura Alanya about the natural resource and environmental sustainability implications of storing and preserving the significantly larger amounts of data that disk images entail. Another key recommendation from the processing section is to prioritize content that is stored on readily accessible contemporary storage devices, such as USB thumb drives and hard drives with readily compatible data connections. We specified that legacy formats with more barriers to access should be prioritized for processing only when the additional resources required to transfer this material can be justified. For example, if there are public services procedures or usage statistics that might be used to guide prioritization for processing. This was partially due to the additional resources required for this work, but also because we recognize that legacy formats like floppy disks cover about a 15 to 30 year time period. And at this point, the amount of archival material, material bound to carrier media is finite, whereas we will continue to see an influx of materials stored in contemporary storage devices. The subject of whether or not to disk image is one that's received a lot of attention lately. And while I know that institutions are beginning to adopt this as practice, there are a few guidelines that I'm aware of that have come out as explicitly in favor of logical file transfer and contemporary storage media as being the default and preferred method. The last processing recommendation that I'll mention is one that has to do with metrics for processing born digital materials. The original version of the UC guidelines really embraced the notion of fact driven decision making, and one of its key goals was to create and implement processing metrics programs at each UC. We all agreed that while using metrics to guide or estimate processing throughput is achievable and helpful in the context of traditional archival material. We wanted to push back on the idea that it's possible to easily develop corresponding processing metrics for born digital. We explained that developing consistent metrics is inherently difficult due to the broad range of possible carrier types, content, file formats, operating systems, and other technical considerations and issues that might arise. Finally, we made two noteworthy recommendations pertaining to description. The first was that we cross-referenced the UC guidelines for born digital archival description, which is a UC-wide descriptive standard that was first published in 2017. These guidelines offer a number of suggestions to improve the overall clarity of archival description uh, for born digital material, and it's great that these two resources now work in concert. Among these recommendations, there was one that stood out to us that we chose to repeat in the UC guidelines for efficient archival processing because we felt it was particularly impactful. Specifically, we reiterated the recommendation to note the inclusion of born digital material at the collection level, regardless of whether or not that material has been processed. This recommendation is very much in line with the guideline stated goal to expose all archival holdings. We felt that being transparent about the full scope of what a collection contains would set users' expectations about the status of the materials up front by providing them with a higher degree of understanding about what they could expect. Additionally, and in reference to the point I made earlier about how upstream choices should be made with a clear understanding in mind of the labor required to provide access, being clear about the presence and status of born digital material will undoubtedly cause less confusion for users and ultimately make our technical services colleagues' lives that much easier. Finally, we also felt that highlighting unprocessed digital material would call attention to the extra labor and resources that born digital necessarily requires and would hopefully serve to subtly remind people that this work doesn't happen automatically. Now that you have a sense for the way that we approach these recommendations, I'm going to hand it over to Kate, who will talk more about the context and impetus for these changes. Thank you, Shira. Um, so, as Elvia mentioned earlier, the decision to weave born digital recommendations throughout the guidelines document stemmed from a conviction that the siloing of born digital processes and labor no longer served the day to day needs of UC archivists responsible for digital archives. I want to give a little bit of context about this point. We know that born digital holdings in our repositories have grown rapidly over the past two decades, and we expect them to continue to increase in size and scope indefinitely. Much of the progress of the, pro the profession has seen in regards to born digital has focused on developing robust technical processes for content capture and preservation, 
which are usually managed by skilled digital archivists, most often at large prominent institutions. And we applaud this progress. But more often than not, the digital archivist is indirectly charged with advocacy and change management responsibilities that the institution may not always be prepared to receive and support. These efforts include things like advocating for online access to born digital records, redefining what accessioning looks like, managing expectations for the length of time it takes to accession and process born digital, retooling collection development priorities, and rethinking the entrenched take it all approach to appraisal that does not translate well to born digital. We, the profession, have relied on this digital archivist labor model to justify the expectation that this vital work can somehow be managed entirely by one person, and that our traditional staffing models and collection workflows can remain insulated from the comparatively new demands of born digital. Significantly, the siloing of born digital labor in the realms of technical processing and digital preservation has impeded the development of a knowledge base and a shared practice of born digital appraisal and accessioning. The longstanding division of labor between curator, archivist, and public services librarian does not respond well to the complex and evolving practices of born digital stewardship. And the limitations to this labor model become palpable as we struggle to effectively process and provide access to a growing digital backlog. Now, I don't want to imply that the profession has not made progress in developing a more sustainable labor model for born digital stewardship. Um, as Chela mentioned in the introduction, in her 2017 OCLC position paper, Research and Learning Agenda for Archives, Special and Distinctive Collections and Research Libraries, um, Chayla Scott Weber articulates the need for a distribution of responsibility if we want to see born digital stewardship become a sustainable and integral part of our archival programs. And indeed, we are beginning to see this distributed labor model emerging with digital archivists developing born digital processing training programs and non-digital archivists working to self-organize peer learning networks and team-based models to responsibly steward born digital in the absence of a dedicated digital archivist on staff. But the progressive work we see in this area has generally focused on processing, leaving a notable gap in shared practice and sustainable labor models for born digital appraisal and accessioning. We sought to address this in our revisions of the guidelines as Shara discussed. We recognize that the siloing of born digital labor remains a critical issue, and it came to a head in our revision process. Interweaving born digital into the guidelines was in some respects a symbolic synthesis. While the members of the revision group and the profession at large have yet to fully realize a complete integration of born digital into standard collection care practices, we felt that modeling this synthesis would support our libraries in moving toward this direction of distributed responsibility. On a micro level, the revision process exposed the complexities of this crucial labor to group members who may not have otherwise understood it, myself included. In this respect, the new version of the guidelines serves as both a training document and an advocacy tool for the kind of modern integrated collection management philosophy that we seek to manifest. We like to think of the guidelines as part of the movement towards sustainable operationalization of born digital care. We published the revised guidelines in May 2020. Do you remember that? Um, the pandemic likely impacted how they have been applied at UC libraries, both positively and negatively. But because of our involvement in this project, the three of us were able to make substantial progress toward integrating born digital care into existing accessioning and processing practices at our own institutions. So now we'll each speak on our progress at our respective libraries. Thanks, Kate. So at UC Irvine, we developed a brand new workflow that was directly influenced by the guidelines revisions. 
and that is a baseline accessioning workflow specific to materials that can be transferred via logical directories. As the guidelines team was finishing up its revisions, I had the opportunity to host a UCLA MLIS intern, Carolina Quesada Meneses, to help me update our Born Digital workflows. The department's existing workflow for Born Digital Care was developed in 2013 and was largely dependent on the use of a singular workstation and the use of the command line to execute one large script to carry out all processing tasks. So virus scanning, disk imaging, generating metadata and packaging. For many years, this workflow served as a one-stop shop to process all born digital formats in our department. However, there, there was a significant, um, there were significant gaps and workarounds in this workflow, including the fact that the workflow essentially pre prepared born digital materials for preservation storage, but did not address how we can provide access to these materials. The imaging script broke a number of times as well, and because of the script's linear logic, all work had to stop when it broke until the script was repaired. Finally, the single processing workstation was at one point uh, physically located outside of special collections, and the majority of disk imaging was at times uh, done by staff outside of special collections as well, which created a number of delays. So when Carolina and I set out to update our workflow, we were influenced by the same ethos of good enough practices that was prevalent in the guidelines for digital recommendations. Our main goal was to create workflows and employ tools that feel accessible to all staff with the resources that we have available. With this new workflow, we are able to build out a more modular and flexible process available on the workstations of all archival technical services staff. So with this new workflow, staff no longer had to rely on the use of a singular workstation or on another staff member outside of the department to complete the work. They are now empowered to accession their own, their own materials at their own pace. This workflow outlines baseline accessioning steps for purely digital archival materials. Um, as Shira previously mentioned, purely born digital or purely digital archival materials make up an increasing percentage of newly acquired materials and will eventually make up the majority of incoming materials as the appearance of carrier-based content like floppy disks, optical media, et cetera, decreases. Logical directories are considered purely digital since they are not carrier-bound and consist of a directory structure organized by folders and files. So we use this workflow for the majority of new incoming born digital accessions that come to us by way of uh, Google Drive, Box or another third party cloud service, uh, as well as network or STP or SFTP transfers, as well as USBs or hard drives. This workflow takes many of the recommendations made in the guidelines and applies them throughout. For example, it incorporates the use of already installed tools on our workstations like Windows Defender that Campus IT updates regularly for virus scanning. It updates, or I'm sorry, it comprises of uh, open source tools to generate a directory file list. And this file list is then appended to the finding aid as a PDF, which helps expose directory level information for researchers. We also no longer disk image by default and simply copy or transfer these materials onto our servers to await accessioning. This workflow also addresses access for materials that pose little to no known PII or confidential or sensitive um, information, we provide access to these materials with just the baseline accessioning work. And we hold off on more intensive processing procedures only for materials that pose that PII or confidential or sensitivity risk. Of course, uh, in the middle of developing these procedures, we were forced to transition to a work from home environment and so we have yet to complete updating our processing procedures for born digital material because this work is reliant on software that is installed on non-networked computers on site. Though, because we have this uh, new accessioning workflow and it is now available to archival technical services via the remote desktop, it has been incredibly helpful for us to um, throughout this past year to stay on top of our incoming materials and digital backlog while we worked from home. And so 
the next steps for us are to integrate this workflow into our, uh, into our accession manual. And we look forward to hopefully going back into the future, um, going back into the office in the near future so that we can continue to do this work. Meanwhile, at UCLA, I worked closely with our accessioning archivist, Jasmine Larkin, to rethink our accessioning protocols for born digital material. First, we began by overhauling the collection assessment requirements during the pre-acquisition phase for curators seeking to collect born digital material. We made a number of changes to these forms in an effort to embed downstream processing and access considerations more deeply into the information gathering process. These changes were directly inspired by recommendations outlined in the guidelines, and I pulled out three examples of these, which are what you see on screen. The first change is that rather than simply asking, does this collection contain private sensitive or confidential information, which can and has been answered in the past with a simple affirmative, Jasmine had the inspired idea to transform the response section into a series of checkboxes. Not only does this make the full scope of what may constitute private sensitive or confidential information more clear, it also provides a chance for curators to discuss with donors where they're likely to find those kinds of files and to record that information where it can be readily accessed by collection management and technical services staff. Another change we made was to add a section stating that we do not accept files that cannot be accessed or preserved by available technology at UCLA with a link out to a list of all the formats that we're currently able to accept. Finally, we added an open-ended question that simply asks, what else can you tell us about the digital material in this collection, which encourages curators to provide any additional information they can about the file's context, creation, arrangement, organization, and management. Taken together, these changes are intended to guarantee not only that appraisal for born digital materials happens prior to acquisition, but that the outcome of the process is thoroughly documented and that all stakeholders have ready access to this information. Once Jasmine and I were satisfied that the curatorial proposal form and the digital mater materials survey would adequately capture all of the information necessary to responsibly acquire and store digital materials, we began to research, develop, and document a set of protocols that would enable curators and donors to jointly review and transfer small sets of digital files directly to UCLA. The workflow that we came up with represents a huge step forward for us and accomplishes several things simultaneously. The high level idea was that after a series of pre-custodial discussions with the donor, the curator, accessioning archivist, and the digital archivist would schedule an appointment during which the curator, the curator would use Zoom's remote desktop access feature to select the desired files from the donor's machine and then transfer the selected files to UCLA's custody by uploading them from the donor's computer to a shared box cloud storage account. Previously, acquiring digital material had been a lengthy and multi-step process requiring several on-site visits to review the media. So not only did this speed up the process considerably, it also removed a critical barrier in that it obviated the need to receive the files on a piece of physical storage media, which in itself represented something of a risk. But after instituting this workflow, we quickly realized that it had additional benefits, which spoke to some of the guidelines key recommendations. First and foremost, providing curators with an opportunity to review the files remotely and transfer only the ones that they are most interested in effectively shifts the burden of appraisal entirely onto the curatorial side which dramatically reduces the necessary resources required for processing and increases the speed with which the files can be made accessible down the line. Secondly, because this upfront appraisal is designed to happen in a team environment where all stakeholders are participating in the Zoom call simultaneously, it means that communication can happen in real time if there are any issues or concerns that arise. Obviously, this workflow isn't practical for all material, but even still, it's an important step forward in that it embraces so many aspects of appraisal and accessioning that the guidelines emphasize as being so critical to responsible and holistic collection management. And at UCSC, I took inspiration from the guidelines to integrate born digital stewardship procedures into our accessioning and processing manual. This slide shows a partial table of contents with newly added sections on born digital acquisition, accessioning, processing, and estimating level of processing effort 
which helps us understand how long it might take to process a digital collection. Um, while these processes still appeared to be somewhat distinct from the quote normal procedures, this still represents um, an improvement for us over um, our previously separate born digital program manual. Uh, and it was inspired by this idea of uh, de siloing born digital labor. This documentation has already supported us in better sharing born digital processing work across multiple staff members. I was also pleased to develop a series of questions to ask our donors during the acquisition process, as well as an addendum to our deed of gift for collections with significant digital content. So both of these new documents will support us in having transparent and productive conversations with our donors about their digital records. Uh, in the next slide, I'll go into detail about our procedures for accessioning foreign digital. Uh, so while we have a clear order of operations for accessioning and processing board digital collections, those of us responsible for this work still felt like it was kind of easy to get lost in the workflow. So my colleague Alex Norton and I recently created a handy checklist for born digital accessioning and processing tasks in uh, the platform GitHub. I create a new checklist, which is called a card in GitHub, for each collection being accessioned or processed and track its progress on a project board, which is viewable to library stakeholders outside of the processing unit and the department. So in addition to keeping us organized, this has the added benefit of making the work more transparent. This slide shows the order of operations for accessioning a born digital collection. I'll walk you through our workflow. All accessioning begins with an examination of the gift paperwork. We create a basic accession record and archive space. Uh, so we have a place to put the information that we gather in subsequent steps. If we are dealing with carrier bound content, we take a moment to do a quick appraisal of the carriers before transferring the files. And we're usually able to weed quite a bit in this step just by making decisions um, from the information on the label. Uh, we document these separations in the accession record. We prepare a folder for the files to land on our library server. We pull and inventory the carriers from the physical collection. Or if we are dealing with like a hard drive or a network transfer, we're experimenting with taking an additional preservation step of generating checksums or hash values for the files before the transfer and then after transfer and then taking the step of comparing these two sets of checksums to ensure nothing has been altered in the transfer process. We transfer the files to our library server. Uh, right now we're primarily using data accessioner, which automatically creates a file manifest and hash values. We document that the transfer took place in the accession record. We then take a high level appraisal pass over the files and weed out any obvious PII or out of scope content. And I just want to note here that we're still in the accessioning phase at this point, and we've now appraised the material twice. Uh, we document extent, date range, location, other things about the records um, in the accession record. And then if the collection is not prioritized for immediate processing, we set up a fixity report to ensure that the content remains unaltered over time. We create a resource record in archive space and export this to a collection level catalog record. And we take a moment to record any notes relevant for future processing. And at this point, the collection goes into our backlog, um, but the files are stable and the collection has an access point and it is prepared for processing. Um, or if the collection is going to be processed immediately, we proceed to the next section of our GitHub card and begin processing the content. So that's our accessioning workflow. And this checks, uh, this checklist really helps us document our, our uh, progress. If something comes up and we have to step away mid accessioning, which happens. All the time, um, so if anyone is interested in seeing our workflows or documentation that the 3 of us have discussed today, please don't hesitate to get in touch and we will be happy to share it with you. So what's next for the UC guidelines? Uh, Elvia, Shira, and I, along with several members of the revision group, are currently undertaking a research project to assess the impact 
of the original guidelines on UC libraries, looking at how this framework has shaped backlogs and collection management practices over the past decade. And this link, bit.ly slash UC dash guidelines, will take you to the current version of the guidelines. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Elvia, Kate, and Shira for your presentation. Um, and thanks also to all of your colleagues in the UC system who worked on these guidelines. Um, this was terrific. We have a few minutes for questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, move over, over to some questions that have been in the chat. Um, so Sherry Berger asks, uh, says, this webinar is super. Every single statement here is on point and necessary. Thank you so much to UC for developing these guidelines and presenting them so clearly. I have a question about something I believe Shira said regarding determining the value relative to the effort of long-term stewardship of born digital material. At your institutions, who undertakes that value evaluation? How does it unfold among the selectors and archivists and perhaps others? Sure. Um, so before I answer that, I will say that um, the way that we have worked as an entire department um, has really shifted um, quite significantly in the past several years. Um, and uh, I want to give a special shout out to um, our former director of library special collections, um, Athena Jackson. She's recently accepted um, another position, so she's no longer at UCLA, um, but she really did a lot to reinforce um, the, the interdependence of each one of the respective units in library special collections. So whereas this valuation used to be done um, typically by collection management, um, sort of after the collection was already brought in, um, we have worked with our head of collection management, Jasmine Jones, um, who has really pushed a lot of um, uh, pushed pushed all of us to rethink how we um, how we work together as units, um, and uh, Jasmine was also involved in the UC guidelines um, as well. So shout out to her. Um, but so we now do um, much 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 more um, upfront information gathering, which really um, before we even bring in a collection does a tremendous deal to kind of document all the information that we would need to make that um, assumption. Um, and so uh, in a, a number of those, so the, two of those forms are what I mentioned already, the curatorial proposal form, um, as well as the digital materials survey. Um, but then we also conduct an operational impact analysis um, based on the, the information entered into those forms. That's something that Jasmine is responsible for doing. Um, and it's really designed to outline assumptions about the collection that will impact post acquisition stewardship and access. Um, as well as expected resources and needs. And this is, um, by the way, before we even acquire the collection, um, we kind of are making those determinations uh, at that stage. So that operational impact analysis, um, I, I work closely with Jasmine as she's creating that to come up with an estimate for, um, for processing those, um, the born digital materials involved in any particular collection. Um, and so, we are already starting to have conversations about the, the value of the collection relative to the effort that it will take to process um, a, even before that stage, even before it's brought in. Um, so hopefully that, that answers that question. I don't wanna take up more time with this answer because I know there are other questions. Thanks, Shira. Um, I'll also take a minute to, to um, plug a report that we actually put out today, the, the OCLC Research, Research Library Partnership um, a, that is, uh, that supports kind of shared and informed decision making for collection building and communication across curatorial and, and public services and technical services colleagues. Um, I just put the link into the chat. Um, and it include and the folks, the working group that that produced it included some of um, some of uh, Elvia and Shira and Kate's colleagues in the UC system. So the it, the their the thinking in these guidelines is definitely also reflected in this report. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, so the question about uh, about when you don't image a disk. Um, so uh, Letha Johnson asks, what steps do you take to preserve existing metadata, e.g. the date created of files if you just copy the files of um, oh, the original media? Um, I can speak to that as like a 
I'm like a lower tech uh, digital archivist <laughs> and we're using, um, we're not disk imaging at Santa Cruz. Uh, and we use uh, the tool data accessioner uh, for most like text, text documents. So not uh, audiovisual content. Um, and that preserves the date, the original metadata within the file. And um, I've also just found that if, if we can't use that tool for whatever reason, if we just, um, if we're doing, if we resort to a, like a drag and drop situation, um, in my experience, uh, the original date metadata is retained. Not always, but generally. Um, I'd like to chime in, uh, in terms of Google Drive, we we get a lot of content from Google Drive, especially in the university archives, since that's what students are using um, to create their content. Um, when we, we receive content from students and student organizations, uh, that obviously is, poses a lot of issues um, since it Google Drive isn't very good at telling you when content was created, only when modified. Um, and so I think that really begs sort of advocacy and um, sort of having straight communication with uh, content creators and asking them sort of for the approximate date of creation um, and, and very much like what Kate had said is it's very low tech and more reliant on on human resources and, and hu that human conversation. Um, so, yeah, so that really just needs to be sort of carried on um, as a sort of descriptive element um, in the finding aid. And so, I mean, unless there's, I don't know, something out there that I'm um, unaware of, um, but, but yeah, that's sort of my, my answer to that question. Great, thank you. Um, we are just about at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up. I apologize, we didn't get to all of the questions today, but we will be sending out the slides and the speaker notes and the links that were referenced here. And I think some of those may answer some of our outstanding questions and, um, and our speakers have generously offered to share um, uh, some of their documentation as well if you if you contact them. Um, so thank you all for being here. And uh, Marilee, anything else? No, I just want to <clears throat> once again thank our uh, speakers for exemplifying such amazing teamwork. Um, I think if you want a strong panel, turn to people who work together as a coherent team already. Uh, so thanks to all of you for being such an attentive um, audience and look out for um, an email from us that will have uh, all of the links, link to the slide deck, the recording, et cetera. Please share generously with your colleagues and be on the lookout for more exciting webinars from us on this and similar topics. So with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for your attention today.